Hey Tony, how are you doing? Bene, molto bene, very Hello. good. Uh, been a bit tired because of uh, you know we 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 only been a few days back from the USA. I went straight to work. Um, it was a great tour, but um, we we ended in Cheyenne and then Denver, which is quite high elevation. So and then eight hours behind the UK, so that kind of took its toll on jet lag. But apart from that, it was very successful. Everybody was very happy. Everybody got paid. The fans were great. Shows were fantastic, and now I'm rested, so yeah. feeling good. Think good. Great, yeah. I saw photos from the tour, and uh, you looked very happy, and the fans too. So it's the best thing. Yeah, you know, I think the thing is, it's uh, you know, obviously financially, um, it gets very difficult. It's very expensive for uh, us to go to the U.S. because of visa charges. And of course, fuel prices at the minute, everybody's economy is crazy. And you want to keep ticket prices at a good price because you want people to go, be able to go to yeah. shows. And there's so many shows, everybody wants to play it, but people can't afford to do everything. So, um, and I, do, I don't want them to miss it exactly. So we kind of offer extras and all kinds of things to, to help them along to be able to come to shows. Keep uh, merchandise prices, you know, good prices, not try and rape anybody and keep them all good yeah. so people can get stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's important to see the fans. You know, that's why we exist. That's why all yeah. of or any of it happens. So it uh, always gives me great, great joy. You know, the people the people make the place, you know, um, and, and, and that's always the best thing. That's always the best thing. So yeah. it's always fun for me, always a joy to meet everybody. You know, I met you in 2018 before your show at Boris Pere. Yeah. And yep. uh, before the interview I did for the offering website back then, uh, I was really excited. And, uh, you know, there is some, there, there was some anxiety because I was oh, big, a big band and I was a bit uh, scared about my English. <laughs> But you <laughs> yeah. were so kind. I I have such a great memory of that moment, and uh, I always, uh, when someone talks about you, I'm like, it's one of the best person in the world. <laughs> oh, well, grazie mille, grazie. That's very sweet, very sweet. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the thing is, it's you know, you can be very tired and and you can be very stressed and you can have lots going on, but um, but that's not. Um, it's not the other artist's fault. And I mean by artists like someone like yourself who, you know, uh, uh, um, is there to talk about things and, and support for the fans and or a photographer or or a, a venue owner or, you know, somebody who's working security. It's not their fault that you have these things going on. You know, they're, they're here to meet you and to help you and, and, and do what they can. So I think um, it's very easy to be... Uh, uh, um, ignorant of people and to give them no time because you don't feel in the best frame of mind or a little tired or a little overwhelmed but it also takes moments just to stop and smile and speak to someone and give them a minute and you know I, I, it's very sweet you say that and I feel very humbled by that and I always say it is the same thing like we, we played in El Paso um, in Texas and it was uh, I think it was a Tuesday and it was very hot, about 110 degrees. Oh. And someone said to me, man, why? how come you're in El Paso on a Tuesday? And I pointed to a guy in a white shirt. And I said, you see that little guy there in the white shirt? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, he just told me he drove from a Chihuahua. He drove like 10 hours to get here. That's why I'm here, you know. And uh, to be able to spend a moment to give him a smile and a hug and sign something and talk to him and let him take a photograph. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's very easy and it's fulfilling to, um, you know, you're communicating with humans, with another human. And, and it's very easy to decide not to do that, but it's also even easier to just say, hello, how are you? How yeah, do you feel? Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that's the connection. You know, when I hear artists say, you know, music, we're, we're trying to communicate through our music. It's like, okay, well, that's great. You can do that across a distance. I could communicate something with someone in the middle of Indonesia or Japan or South America that I've never met before, and they feel inspired or they feel connected to it. And that's brilliant. 
I could help them through their day or save them through a trauma. But when they're right in front of me, I can't ignore them. I can't treat them like they don't mean anything. That's even more important. And I have to hear their stories. So I think that's the real communication. Once you're on the ground and you get to talk to people and touch people, you know, I'm a great, I'm a great toucher. <laughs> Not in a perverted way, but I, I, I'm very tactile. I like to touch somebody because I feel their energy and, and that's all and and possibly give them some of my energy, which hopefully is a positive thing. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh let's talk about uh, your last album, There's Only Only Black, uh, that was re released last September. Uh, yeah. How was the writing process of the album and uh, what are the main differences compared to your Ave album? Well, I think that uh, when we when we began Ave, we were we were uh, at the front end of getting a record deal. So I was quite focused on that with John Sazula, bless him, who's now passed uh, um, and who was helping me with the management. And so <laughs> there was a lot of business stuff going on. I had to, I had some shows I was trying to get lined up. So it's quite, quite busy for me. And I have a day job, which is quite taxing too. And so we began the writing process and myself and Jeff Mantis. And he, the idea was we would both just compose songs and then share them with each other. And we'd pick the ones we liked and we'd worked on them. But um, I was so busy. I said to Jeff, because he was being quite prolific in his writing for Arve. I just said, just keep writing music. Just keep writing music until if you get stuck, tell me and then I'll I'll send something. But um, he kept writing and writing and everything he sent me, I loved. And we ended up with 12 songs. And I said, okay, stop. That's it. That's it. Let's pick from those 12. Um, and he said, are you sure? You didn't send me anything. I said, I don't think I need to. Let's work on the lyrics and work on the whole idea. And so we did it like that. So it was kind of a practical thing, not um, not because uh, we wanted him to write all the music and I didn't want to write anything or anything like that. It just so happened that uh, I was so busy and he was so prolific in his writing of the music that we ended up with the album without worrying about it. And and I loved everything on there. And then, But when we came to doing this one, the idea I had was to make it a double album or two albums that had a story, a through line. Yeah. And it was going to be based on Dante's Inferno, you know, the nine circles of hell, kind of birth to death journey of every person on the planet, every human on the planet. You know, what happens in your life, the, the kind of trauma you go through, the kind of greed and gluttony and, and uh, all of the business that you meet on your way, that you learn from on your way to the grave, which we ultimately have to go to. Um, and so we were writing, uh, uh, I wrote 12 songs, Mantis wrote 12 songs. And then, so we had 24 songs, which was would cover both albums. And then we decided we'd pick the best 12 to go on uh, the first album, which was going to be called Nine. And I'd written a track called Nine. And I started on the artwork. And then one day Mantis says, said, oh, I sent you a song through. So I said, okay. So I had to listen to this music. I said, wow, I love this. I love this. So I said, oh, um, I've got some ideas. Have you got any ideas for lyrics or any, any of the song? And he said, well, actually, I wrote the title and I've written the lyrics. So I said, okay. So what's it about? And he said, well, I've called it There's Only Black. Uh, because when I had my death experience, when he had his heart attack, yeah. he said, I... Uh, I didn't see anything. I just saw a vortex, almost like a black hole and just blackness. I didn't see any light. There was no angels. I didn't see anything, just black. And when he was describing that to me, you know, it just sunk into my head. And I went, OK, that's the name of the album. There's only black. And I know what I want on the cover. Um, and so the whole thing changed, really. So. We took six of his songs, six of my songs, gave them all to Nuclear Blast. They arranged what order they thought they were going. And then I composed the artwork, the layout. Um, and it was all based around that question, you know, because for humanity, we're, we're, her, we're our worst enemy. You know, on the one hand, we're looking for a cure for cancer, while on the other hand, we're trying to develop 
weapons that cause cancer. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, that's the anomaly of human nature. We kill and we try to save at the same time. And so I thought, you know, but the question, uh, uh, which is the biggest thing for humans is, or, or certainly for humankind is, why are we here? What's the purpose? Um, and then that gave me posit about the universe. You know, if you go into a black hole, what's inside? You know, nobody knows. Um, you could find out by going into a black hole. But once you go in there, you can't come back out to tell me. So it, it's something you have to commit to fully. And only you will find out the answer. Much like death, much like traveling to the end of the universe. So insurmountable questions we will not have answers to. But the only answer you can find is if you do it yourself. So when you die, your experience will be your experience. It won't be mine and you won't be able to come back and tell me what it was like. I have to do it myself in order to experience it. And I thought, well, that's also quite clever for the music. If I put a black hole uh, with an energy barrel around it on the cover of the album, it's almost inviting you to come in and experience the album for yourself. You might find salvation. You might find it entertaining. You might find nothing. You might find that you hate it, but but it will be your experience. It won't be someone else's. It will yeah. always be your own. And so it just all kind of fit that way. So yeah, yeah. And in my opinion, it's really a good album. And uh, I've listened several times. And thank you. Yeah, it's. It's intense. Yes, there's an intensity. And I I also think that, Chris, that um, a, a lot of people have said to me, particularly on this tour and, and live dates that we've done, uh, who who love the album or like the album, but certainly who, people who love the album said, you know, it took me two or three listens to actually begin to understand what was happening and to get it, you know, because yeah. it's very easy to put it on. And, and in this day and age, where everybody is swiping and, and listening to streams, you know, you could listen to an album in five minutes because you listen to a bit of this, a bit of this, a bit of this, a bit of this. Whereas in the old days when we would get an album from a band, we listened to every single song all yeah. the way through, then listen to the, you know, we, 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 we didn't want to waste our money or our time. We wanted to hear everything. Um, and now people hear bits of things, but I think that's where the videos come in because then, you get a visual attraction. And so that takes you through the music and takes you through the lyrics and hopefully gives you a bit more depth of understanding of what the song is trying to be. And I don't think sometimes songs don't need to be deep and you could listen to There's Only Black and certainly you could listen to it on one level and it's just some music. It could be thrashy or whatever it is. Um, but if you then uh, want to let it move deeper you can then understand the lyrics more understand the theme of the album and then you can find something else and so maybe it's a progressive thing to do that you know to to uh, not just have some cool tracks but have yeah i guess a story you know like like entertainment you know um you could go watch a marvel movie and think wow that was amazing uh and maybe miss what they're trying to tell you in the story but it's not important. You can still be entertained by that. But then uh, you could go and see a play with two people talking for like an hour and it could have a huge impact on you. So I think it's, it's again, it's about the individual's experience. And sometimes it could take you longer, but it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, if you feel it, you feel it, however you feel it. Yeah. Um, early before you wrote me that uh, your book it's going yes. to be released in Italy, in Italian. So when is going to happen? Well, um, uh, Mickey Eval from the Mugshots, he uh, contacted me and said about writing the book because I, I had uh, some stuff prepared for a book and I was working on a kind of artistic documentary about the subgenre and how, um, particularly in Italy, where the government seemed to be looking down on tattoo art and and piercing and heavy metal and thinking it was low art and they, they thought it was bad for the younger audiences where, you know, Italy was built on, you know, frescoes and beautiful architecture and opera. Um, and it kind of got to me and I thought, well, you know, 
um, you had Da Vinci and Michelangelo, two amazing artists. But if you had a great artist like uh, Veltiama in Rome, who tattoos, kind of medievally tattoos is his favorite things, but he tattoos on people's bodies. And I thought, well, isn't he like, he's like uh, Da Vinci and uh, uh, um, uh, um, and Michelangelo, except he's not painting on a static surface. He's not making a body out of clear. He's actually putting artwork on a living thing. And surely that's incredible art to, to have. If if Da Vinci had painted the Last Supper on the statue of David, how cool! How cool would that be? You know, you'd actually have two great pieces of artwork on top of each other, and so that made me think. And and also, you know, opera is classical and very Italian and very high art. But then um, the whole genre and and creativity that's around our music, but from journalists to uh, producer, record producers to uh, artists, video producers. I mean, Italy is is crammed with this incredible art and talent. And I thought that is the next. You know, in 100, 200 years, they'll be looking at people who were tattooing and piercing and creating underground music, someone like Steve Sylvester from Death SS, and he will be the Pavarotti of that moment. And, and people will be looking back and going, oh, my God, this was incredible, you know. Yeah. And so I was working on that. And, and Mickey said, well, you know, should we put it into book form? And one thing led to another. And so I composed with him. Um, he, he did all the writing for me. Um, kind of book on my musical journey and I uh, was looking for publishers and Tsunami Publishing uh, uh, in uh, Italy wanted to do the book oh, purely in Italian so the first edition is purely in Italian and then much later on we'll have a translated version um, but it goes out, it was supposed to go out this month but we had to do some rewriting for the publisher okay. so now they said they're just going to let summer go and so it'll be in the uh, early fall so um just after summer so around about august now i think okay i will have to book because i cannot travel there and buy it i have to buy from internet <laughs> uh don't worry i'll make sure you get a copy you don't, oh, have, great. To, you don't have to worry <laughs> I'll, I'll sign a copy for you and i'll send it straight to you please thank you so much <laughs> you're ben you're welcome prego um let's talk about your uh, acting career so you act in several uh, several movies. You you had a part. Yes. Uh, how did it happen that you start? Uh, you were working in the theater system. Yes, I, I, from there, yeah. from, from what I remember, start. Uh, but yeah, it's true. Yeah, I was. I was. You know, I'd, I'd worked in theater, <laughs> and uh, I ended up working for the Royal Shakespeare Company, and. Uh, I hadn't really thought about acting, you know, and um, and I was just now working in theatre and I'd, I'd kind of stopped doing the music. And I found myself in India with the Royal Shakespeare Company and we had a problem with one of the actors who got sick. And uh, we were doing uh, a comedy of errors and I love Shakespeare, so I would always be quoting the show all the time. And um, when we had the problem with the actor, um, the stage management came to me and said, Tony, we have an issue because one of the actors is sick. And I I was only there as a master carpenter. So I was building the set and looking after it and everything. And I said, okay, well, uh, have you got any ideas of an actor we could get in India? Because Indians love Shakespeare and theatre. So I thought they were thinking on that. And, and they said, well, we actually thought much quicker if you did it. And I was like, me? Oh my God. I, I mean, I'm never, I don't know. And I was, and they went, but you know the play? And I said, well, yeah, I know the play, but I mean, and I just thought, you know, why not? Uh, you know, you know, in life, just say yes. If you try it and you're crap or you don't do it very well, you know you can't do it. So you don't have to do it again. But what if you could do it and you enjoyed doing it? And you said no because you were scared. So I thought, well, I should say yes and then see if I like it. And, of course, I did say yes. I did go on and play the part. And uh, they were all very happy. I really had fun. And then I forgot about it. And when we came back to London, I left the show and obviously went to another job. And then after about a month, I got a call from the artistic director who said, oh, we, we have a problem on the show again, much like we did in India. 
And I just went into the dressing room and said to the cast, do we know anybody in London we could get very quickly who could help us out? And they all said, you. <laughs> so I was like, OK. So I just went and did it again. So I was actually you know, on stage with the Royal Shakespeare Company doing a part, thinking, I can't believe this. I mean, I love theatre. I love Shakespeare. This is amazing that I'm doing this. So I asked him, I said, as a favour, you don't have to pay me, but teach me how to do this properly. So I did a series of workshops with him, um, asked him if I should see an agent. He said, no, you don't have any experience. You don't have any, you know, you haven't been to drama school. I, I don't think you're ever going to be able to find an agent. And I thought, well, I might as well see if I can. So I, I called two agents. Both wanted to see me. Uh, both told me I was too old. Uh, both told me I was inexperienced. Both told me there was probably a little chance I'd get any parts. But one of them said, OK, I'll take you on and we'll see how it goes for a couple of months. Um, and once they said that, the other agent called me and said, why did you go with them? We wanted to take you on. And I said, you tell I was too old and... So anyway, it was quite a funny situation. But within a month of being signed, I was on the set of Judge Dredd. And, and then I did some television. Uh, and then I did another play. And I was I thought, wow, this is, this is going pretty well. And I didn't intend to do it. And it just happened. Uh, but I must be okay at it because these people want to take me on. I did Tamburlaine. Uh, um, and... Uh, I was down to play a main character in Jean de Florette by Marcel Pagnol uh, and Rent the Musical. And I was like, wow, this is blowing my mind. This is not something I'd thought about. And then um, I kind of, uh, my agent decided he was retiring. So that, I left it at that. I went to work back in theatre. And I was actually working on the Queen Musical, installing the Queen Musical, when I got a phone call from his assistant saying, could I go to Park Lane and meet Peter Weir and meant, uh, and a very big agent. So I was like, yeah, well, I'm a busy at work, but OK. So I had my lunch. I ran up to Park Lane, met Peter Weir. I didn't know who he was and then realised later he did the Truman Show, directed uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock, Gallipoli, you know, this huge director. Yeah. And this woman who was a casting director, the biggest one in the UK, um, so I made my excuses, did a shit kind of interview and then just ran back to work. My agent tried to call me and I didn't answer the phone. Um, and then the next morning, because I thought, oh, fuck, I made a right fool of myself. And the next morning she called me and said, will you talk to me now? And I said, OK, listen, I'm really sorry I didn't talk to you yesterday. I was busy with work. I was all dirty. I ran up to meet these people. They were very nice, but I think I did a shit job. Um, so I'm really sorry. And it's a big Hollywood movie. It's 20th Century Fox. It's Russell Crowe. I said, nah, I'm not going to get that. And and when I finished, she said, oh, is that everything you want to say? And I said, yes. She went, OK, well, they loved you and they want you to start. You have to fly to Mexico next month. And I was like, what? So, <laughs> and I was doing Master and Commander for five months, which was like, again, mind blowing. Paul Bettany, Russell Crowe, 20th Century Fox. You know, I, it was amazing. So. When people have kind of said, um, how did you do it? It's like, I've got no idea, Chris. It just happened. I wanted to do it. I thought once I did theatre, I thought, oh, I'd like to do maybe some television. And the next thing I was doing television. And then I thought, well, it'd be cool to do a movie. So then I was doing a movie. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great to do a Hollywood movie? And then I'm doing a Hollywood movie. So maybe that's maybe that was me projecting. And maybe that was my positive nature making it happen I don't know but I certainly didn't intend to go out and do it I just decided I wanted to do it yeah. uh, and it happened so yeah maybe that's a maybe that's something for anybody listening or watching you know make sure you want to do it uh, put your heart into it and just go and do it just follow your dreams follow. The... follow your dreams absolutely absolutely yeah. okay that, that was a really interesting and inspiring story about are you start to acting and it's it's crazy but let's go to your fans questions ah. there are a few let's see if it's opening so david ask the acoustic venom empire 
of Evil did a couple of years back was insanely good, so in on YouTube. Great delivery that brought out the bluesy feel in the classics. How about a Venom Inc. acoustic assault someday as a bonus uh, CD, perhaps? Brilliant question. Brilliant, brilliant response to what we did. And yes, very much so. Um, it was actually uh, one of Cronus's songs, Sons of Satan, that he wrote, which has a, a very simple a kind of bluesy vibe to it. Uh, but also Angel Dust, which Mantis wrote, is very blues based. Um, and so we were in Japan. We'd been doing a show. They wanted us to do an in-store chat in a meet and greet. And I had this idea. <laughs> I said, get, get two acoustic guitars and we'll kind of just play acoustically some songs for people. And I, the idea was they would ask us questions. We might break and play a song. We would talk more about our careers. They'd ask more questions. But it became just a gig. The Japanese, they didn't ask any questions. They just said, play Witching Hour. So we played Witching Hour. Then they went, play Bloodlust. So we played Bloodlust. In fact, I think we played a longer set at the in-store than we did on the actual event. But, um, yeah, it was amazing to play you know, uh, those songs acoustically and hear them in their real form, which is very blues and rock and rock and roll based. So um, it was very popular. They loved hearing them. And uh, yeah, it's always been at the back of my mind. So I think, yeah, I think particularly now from songs from RV2 and songs from uh, uh, There's Only Black, we have a lot of songs that when you strip them down and play them acoustically, slow them down perhaps, uh, add some harmonies, they're very, they're very, um, they're very beautiful songs. I mean, that sounds a bit mad when you listen to the noise that's going on when we play them in uh, live and in the studio. But yeah, they're very beautiful. So um, I think that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Maybe we should handpick some songs and put together an acoustic CD to put in as a bonus. Very good idea. Yeah. So let's go to uh, Roderick. Any chance to bring some Empire song into future Venom Inc. set list? You know, that's something that's something we were talking about and something I've been considering for some time because, you know, the idea of recording your music and not putting it out for people to listen to is always ironic to me when people say, oh, that band sold out. And it's like, well, you every band sells out. If if you're If you're not the only one who listens to your music, you sold out. If you want to make a record that somebody wants to listen to, is that selling out? If they buy it from you so you can, you know, make another one, is that you selling out, you know? And I think the the term is, and, and, and the, the look of that, how people look at that is probably a bit misguided. But I think for me, it's like, I, I always said to Mantis, you know, if you make some music, then you deserve, people deserve to be able to have a listen to it. You know, you if it affects one person or one million people, it's still important. You know, it's like any creative art. You know, you don't paint a, the best painting you ever did in your life and then stick it under your bed and not let anybody see it. Or you shouldn't, you know, because you've expressed yourself and, and you did it so you could communicate your idea or, or colors or what you see, you, you you try to communicate that. So it's, you deserve for yourself and for other people to be able to give it into public so they can observe it and some might like it, some might not, but, but you might communicate your idea with somebody else. And so I think uh, the same thing about the Empire stuff. When we did, the, you know, the first album, Hell to the Holy uh, and even Crucified, which was kind of redone Venom songs from my era, um, with Mark Jackson, uh, but certainly um, from our, um, the first album, Hell to the Holy, there's some great songs on there. Hellspawn was very popular, Hell to the Holy too. And I thought, yeah, they all work with who we are right now. Um, so, yes, I actually have been discussing bringing them into the set. So fingers crossed we're going to have some Eighth yeah. Gate in there and some Hellspawn. It would be good, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, asking you... Now, because we have uh, less than 10 minutes with this ah. uh, Zoom meeting, but okay. uh, if we run out of time, do you want that we start another? 
Yes, yes. If you're happy with that, that's fine. I, I'm happy, but if you are fine, I don't know if we need to wait five minutes then, but let's see. Let's go ahead with the interview and then uh, probably we are running out of time. So we are okay. uh, the next, the next we'll meeting uh, right after. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so how did you get into heavy music when you were... Well, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I was in the 70s, a child of the 70s. So it was kind of rock, really, yeah. with um, the sweet and slid and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we emigrated to Canada. My mother and father split when I was nine. I moved to Canada in the early 70s. And, um, and there I was introduced to Aerosmith, Kiss, Ted Nugent, all that kind of stuff. Journey, Foreigner, Toto, you know. And so it all became kind of just normal music to listen to. It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't heavy rock. It was just rock. So, and I thought that's the world all heard that, you know, apart from country, Western or soul or Motown. And, um, and uh, my mum and dad were, were heavily into Elvis and uh, Bill Haley and Roy Orbison, all that old stuff. So I'd kind of been brought up on that, um, more so than the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And um, when we came back to the UK, which was the late 70s, uh, I walked straight. Uh, I did my last year of high school and I walked straight into punk rock and I was confronted with the Stex Pistols and, and uh, you know, Stiff Little Fingers and The Clash and uh, UK Subs and this extreme music and these kids just throwing themselves around, jumping up and down. And I was like, wow, I'd seen nothing like it. You know, my hair was long. I had a mustache. I had, yeah. you know, flares and high heel shoes. And there were these guys like with short haircuts and spitting and jumping around with leather jackets on. I was like, whoa. And I thought like I, I came to another planet. <laughs> but after a, a very short period of time, I kind of, the music, I suppose it was my age too. I was 16 and the music kind of started to speak to me. Um, and it seemed so expressive, so freeing, so soul freeing that I thought, wow, I, I want to I engorge this I, as much as I can. So I went to every concert I could see from Devo to the Dickies to, to Ian Jury and the Blockheads, the Stranglers, you name it. Uh, I went to the shows and I loved every minute of that Um you know, and I, and what it taught me was you didn't have to be the best guitar player in the world or the best singer in the world. As long as you had something you wanted to say or express, you could. And it was like, wow, this is so different, you know. Um, we had been listening to, you know, Oreo Speedwagon and Journey and Foreigner, all these corporate, um, very well-turned-out, versatile instrumentalists and singers. I know here was you know, Elvis Costello and, and, and the police and, and uh, the Stiff Little Fingers and Roots and, you know, the Angelic Upstarts, one of my favourites, where they were just shouting a lot of the time yeah. and playing really roughly. And so I thought, wow, yeah, I could do that. So I started to have a band and band ideas, started to play punk. And then in 78, I think it was, uh, I think about 78, I went into a club to see a punk band who were, uh, supporting another band I'd never heard of and uh, went backstage and they said to me oh Tony you should go and watch the main band and I said yeah what they like I've never heard of them and they said well they got long hair and I was like oh my god they're hippies I don't want to see hippies and they went no no they're kind of punky and I was like okay they convinced me anyway so I went back into the club I got all the way down to the front and uh, and then I heard this noise and the lights went on, and that was Motorhead. And it was on the Overkill tour, I think. Or might have been the Motorhead tour. I can't remember particularly, but but I remember I was shocked, completely shocked. And I walked out thinking, oh, my God, I have to do that. I have to do that. So how do I change my band from being just punk to this, whatever it is? And so I kind of merged the Dickies, who were ultra fast, with Motorhead, who were ultra dirty and loud, and that was kind of how I formed my first band, you know, uh, my first metal band. It would, I didn't know, I didn't, I mean, I couldn't distinguish what it was. I, whatever they were doing, I just, it just really hit me so hard and made me feel so full of emotion and so full of energy and life. 
I thought, wow, I want to do, I want to have that every day. You know, when I, when I went to my, I didn't have any records of Motorhead and I went to a buddy's house, my friend's house and his younger brother had the first album Motorhead on Chiswick. And, uh, I was just talking and, and uh, I mentioned Motorhead and his brother went, oh, I've got that album. I said, oh, there's an album. He was like, yeah. So he brought it in and I, I played only Motorhead. I put it on the record on and every time the track finished, I picked the needle up and put it back. And after about the 15th time, his brother went, for fuck's sake, can you stop playing that one song? And I said, I can't. There's something about that song that is just changing my life. I have to keep listening to it. And I think I spent a month listening to just that song. I didn't listen to any other music, just Motorhead by Motorhead, the one song. And it changed my whole life. It changed my whole life. And, uh, you know, even today, I got to tell you, Chris, when Lemmy died, um, I only used to drink tequila, really. Um, I mean, beer when I was very young, but I stopped drinking beer because I didn't like it. So I only drank tequila. I only white tequila, clear tequila, blue guava. And uh, and um, I, that night when they told me he died, I said, oh, my God, can you get me a Jack Daniels and Coke? And they were like, but you don't drink Jack Daniels. And I said, yeah, but tonight I'm going to for Lemmy. And if you could move my microphone up a little bit so it's pointing down. And I had a war pig uh, necklace. I put that on and I wore, I wore that every day, every show put my mic up every show, have a Jack Daniels and Coke before I go on every show. And it's not to be Lemmy because nobody could be him. And it's not to try and be Lemmy because there's no point. It's because he changed my life musically, uh, even though he didn't know he'd done that. And I don't want him to go. So if I can, if every show he's with me, I'm doing it for him. It's kind yeah, of like... Keeping the it's, memory. Yes, yeah. yes. So that's why. Yeah, so Brilliant. now it's the moment of uh, random topics. I have this uh, little jar with a piece of paper where I wrote topics. And they Brilliant. Are... So <laughs> let's see what is happening. That's a great idea, by the way. I yeah, love that. Let's, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh -oh. What are you going uh -oh. to get? The first one is uh, travels. Oh. So I get one. Perfect. So, do you like to travel? You know, I love to travel, and you, I'll, I'll I'll tell you how it all began. The, you know, I think all of that, which probably led to music, was I was there uh, fifteen, and I was in school, and I was in a, a tutorial class, and at that time in the north of England, we had were very heavy industry, so it was coal mining and shipbuilding and coal mining had had uh, stopped so it was just shipbuilding and all of my family being of irish descent were shipbuilders so my father my his his the brothers and my cousins and my grandfather and everybody worked in the shipyards and so that was my destiny and i looked at my father getting up at five o'clock in the morning in cold winter and going deaf and having all kinds of ailments and drinking beer every day and smoking nonstop. And I thought, oh, my God, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And so I was in a tutorial and you either worked in the shipyards or you went to unemployment. And uh, the teacher asked everybody, what would you like to do when you leave school? And people were saying things like join the army or the Navy or, you know, something like that. Uh, become a nurse or a doctor or something. And um, he got to me and said, Mr. Dolan, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to meet everybody on the planet, sir. And he said, what? I said, I want to meet everybody on the planet. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. Doing what? I said, I don't know, just meeting them. And he said, you're an idiot, boy. He said, you'll never do anything. And so he, they, they then invited us to read a book, just have a read of a book. And I picked up a National Geographic, and in the National Geographic uh, was a carnival in Rio, and it was amazing. I just looked at this. You know, I came from a very grey industrial world where it was always wet and cold in the north of England, and here was this 
fantastic, colorful beaches and, and people full of color and everybody was smiling. There was caprenja and, and empanadas and, and, you know, this exotic foods and, and this carnival atmosphere and this beautiful location. <clears throat> and, um, and I just thought, I have to go there. Well, I don't know where that is, but I'm going. That's what my <clears throat> target in life is to go there and to see this kind of thing all over the planet. And that was my adventure. And I wish I could speak to that teacher now when he says, so what did you do? And I said, I, I didn't meet everybody on the planet yet, but I met quite oh, a few of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing as much as I can to meet everybody and traveling the world. So from that moment of opening that National Geographic and seeing Rio de Janeiro, that made me want to see the world, taste everybody's food. You know, I mean, Italy, for example, you know, the first time I went there was 84, 85. And, and I'm, I, I've been all over Italy. I've eaten all kinds of food, met the most incredible people. And it, it's one of my absolute loves, Italy. Um, everywhere from the north, from the, you know, from the foot, feet, feet of the Alps all the way to the heel of the boot and into Sicily. And uh, yeah, just the most incredible place. And, uh, you know, you have the most incredible foods and hear the most incredible stories. And it, it's not, uh, it's not solo. It's like every country has the most amazing things to offer. And you just have to allow them to, to offer it, you know, and experience it. Um, much like language, you know. I'm not one of the English people who asks for an English product just louder when I'm in a different country. I try and learn a bit of each language just so that I can feel that I should be there visiting, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah, love love traveling. Can, just I've done it all my life now, and uh, I think I've been I've been taking planes since 1972, uh, and uh, I still I still get excited about being on a plane landing in somewhere wonderful you know Cagliari or Milan or you know Berlin or Paris or I just love it I love it yeah what is the your favorite way to travel do you like to travel uh, with a flight with the bus with a well, ship? yeah I think it varies you know it depends where you are you know if you're in um, Scandinavia you have to travel by ship because you see the most incredible fjords and, and, and uh, you know, scenery is the incredible, much like Alaska. When you travel up to Alaska, you know, taking the, the boat up the coast is just breathtaking and the lakes and, and all of that. And I think, uh, you know, through Europe, I like to be on trains, particularly in Italy, because, um, you know, you pass this wonderful landscapes and all of these uh, vineyards and orchards and and you know you see small towns you might miss if you're on a motorway or certainly if you fly and in America too you know we just did uh, part one of the American tour we started in Texas went out to through Arizona Nevada went to California went up through Oregon uh, into Washington then in towards Salt Lake City Idaho and and ended in Cheyenne Wyoming and then Denver you know, Colorado, and, and we did that all by tour bus. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd stay up late, um, one or two o'clock in the morning with my head out of the bus window, looking at the stars in the middle of the desert, thinking, wow, look at that. And then get up very early in the morning to do my training and be looking at landscapes of the prairies or the Rockies and or the Oregon forests, you know, and just think, wow, what an incredible planet we live on. And so I suppose it depends if we're flying into a festival and we're just playing on the day, then obviously you want to fly because you have to, because you go straight in, play and come straight back out again. But if you can take the time, I think to drive is wonderful. I love driving everywhere. You know, I once drove um, from uh, London all the way down to, I think it was Venice, and then I drove down to Rome, and then I drove all the way back through France, uh, <laughs> along the Mediterranean and up towards uh, Calais, which was breathtaking. You know, I couldn't even begin the amount of things I saw and, and, and places I stopped to have lunch and, 
you know, uh, and the language and the smells and the, the flowers and just the most incredible things you miss if you fly over them. Um, so, yeah, it, it depends where you are. But if you can, the train is always so good. It gets you there a little bit quicker uh, than driving. Uh, but again, you miss things. If you can drive, always drive, I think, on a bus uh, um, under your own steam because you can stop. You can, you know, you see signs for somewhere and you 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 might have missed it a million times, but if you see a sign and just think, let's go have a look at this, you find yeah. something incredible, you know, something incredible you've never seen before, smelt before, tasted before. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think if I could drive everywhere, I would do that. Yeah, that's that's great. And yeah, you told that uh, every, every place has its uh, beauty, its yeah. uh, smells, uh, its... Unique, you unique quest. Uniqueness, yeah, completely. And and I think you know the thing is, Chris, that when when you live somewhere and when you've been brought up somewhere, you don't see that because it's just home to you. So you know you they, they, you know I've had people say, oh my god, I hate living here, and I go why, and they go oh, it's boring, nothing happens. I go oh my god, but I think it's the most amazing place. It's beautiful. Of course, I wasn't born there, so I see it with fresh eyes, I see yeah. it with new eyes. Um, so I think everybody should travel because, and the thing is, the place that you live, that you've lived all your life, that you may not think is the best place on the planet. If you travel for six months, when you get back there, you want to get back there. And when you get back there, you realize how great it is and, yeah. and why you love, love it. So um, that's why everybody should do it, you know? Yeah, true. So let's, Take another another random. Let's see what happened. What are we uh -oh. going? Got me cars. Nervous. Nervous. We got cars. So, Ooh. what's your favorite car? Well, you know, I've never. My favorite car is a car that I can get in, and uh, that doesn't break down and gets me to where I'm going. <laughs> That's about it. I've never been kind of. You know, I've never been. I've never been a person about things. You know, a cup is a cup. Uh, a plate is a plate. Uh, a house is a house. Um, as long as it's practical. Uh, and as long as it does. It's the same thing with cars, you know. I don't, um, I'm not a material person. So, um, you know, for me, more important things is people. That's the more important things, you know. Yeah. So, you know, you could visit someone's house, which is not a very beautiful house and maybe it's a bit messy and maybe the wallpaper's coming off and maybe the windows are slightly not working but if the person who lives in there is a wonderful person you don't see any of that yeah. um yeah and i think i think a lot of people see cars as a status symbol and uh I, I i don't worry about that you know uh, like i say as long as everything works on the car and I can, it does what I want it to do, then I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, so if I could pick any car in the world, um, I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't be a Ferrari or a Porsche or anything like that. It's like, it's kind of not me, you know? It's like me, it's like me going to an event where I have to use a, wear a suit and a shirt and a tie. You know, I don't look very good in a suit. I'm not the right shape. And I always feel uncomfortable because it's, yeah. it's not me. It's not who I am, you know? So... I guess it's the same thing with a really beautiful car. Um, it just isn't who I am, you know. I'm more basic, so I'm I'm good. I'm good. A Fiat Panda. It's a good good answer, actually. I always say that Fiat Panda is the good one because it you can drive everywhere. Everything you need fits inside because it's, and it's economical. Usually, you know, usually those. Uh, car like Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, they they are not car that you can travel with stuff. You can it's it's just for two person mostly of the time. Yeah. I prefer something that is functional. Functional, exactly, exactly. I mean if you if if <clears throat> if you're on if me and you were on vacation somewhere and we're 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 sort of on the coast and we have a wonderful roads to drive, 
then absolutely let's hire ourselves a Lamborghini and just give ourselves a treat. So, um, but it is that. But uh, generally, day to day, I want something that's comfortable and practical and easy and economical. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that's what I look for mainly out of a car. Also, um, like if it. something happened, like someone uh, rush on you, you, you are not crying too much. It's not, it's, yeah, it's always going to be expensive because cars are expensive, but not that much as if it's a really expensive yeah. car, you know? Yes, yes, totally, totally. If I was, if I was ultimately rich like Jeff Bezos or something, then yeah, absolutely. I'd have 10 Lamborghinis and all kinds of colors because I wouldn't care. But uh, even then, I probably wouldn't because why would I have them? So, you know, and I always think this thing when I watch uh, sort of rap stars who, you know, you go and see their crib and they got like 15 cars. It's like, what am I going to do with 15 cars? Yeah. I only need one. I only need one. Can I, can I get my luggage in the back? That's all I'm interested in. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about pizza. Do you like mm. pizza? <laughs> you know what? The thing is, and this is my honest thing, right? Um, please nobody be offended. But uh, when we ever toured, uh, on the riders, they would always put, um, at the end of a show, to give us some food, pizzas. So, like, 10 pizzas, what do you want on your pizzas? And... You know, and and very American thing to do with the American bands always get pizzas at the end of shows. And uh, I told my agent, I went, well, can you stop giving us pizzas at the end? Like, don't put it on our rider. I'd rather have some kind of snack, but not pizza. And because I think for me, I don't know why, maybe it's because uh, I ate the best pizza I thought I'd ever eaten in Florence before. And I had the best wine and uh, from Tuscany and uh, and the best Parmesan and, and the nicest coffee. And, and, and so for me, it was quite an emotional experience uh, from a food point to a culinary point of view. So I eat pizza if I'm in Italy. But if I'm not in Italy, why would I eat pizza? You know, it and that's sense. my thing. It's like it, 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 it pizza is uh, pizza should be eaten in Italy the way Italians eat pizza. And not eaten elsewhere. And if I'm in, say, Japan or uh, Manila or uh, Sao Paulo or um, Costa Rica, why am I going to eat pizza? <laughs> why would I eat pizza? It's yeah. like, I'm surely they make great local food I should be eating, like an empanada or whatever it is, tortilla. But pizza is for Italy. That's how I view it. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the best pizza, and I think, again, much like pasta, if you're in Venezia or, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, Padua or Bologna is like, you know, you have their pizza, uh, their pasta or their, their version of a pizza, you know, whatever, whatever the local thing is. And it's very simple. It's usually very simple. You know, some creme or tomato, or, you know, some basil, bit of cheese, and... Uh, and boom, you have the most incredible, you must do incredible food. And yeah, with very little done to it. And you find once you move out of Italy, much like the pizza you get in America, you know, which is cool, but it's like it's got 50,000 things on it and it's all stuck together with cheese. And it's like, but in Italy, you could just have tomato and basil on a, on a pizza base. And it's with the nut, with the best wine and a tiny piece of Parmesan. Boom. It's perfect. I, I I'm I'm agree <laughs> on this point that uh, outside of Italy it's really hard to find uh, a very proper pizza because you yeah. can find something that you can uh, yeah still enjoy but it's not not the same it's not, not the same it's not there yet <laughs> no. so but I think uh, that's I think for me you know I think that's Oh, it's the romance, the romance in food. You know, there's a romance in food in in uh, wine, for example. And so, you know, the um, every every country has its own dish, and uh, which is their kind of romantic dish. Usually, it's a poor man's dish, 
like a shepherd's pie for he, us here or, or pizza for Italy. It was made very simply out of flour and water, a bit of tomato and a bit of basil from the garden, maybe some cheese on top. And it's very simple, you know, and um, the wine, the very same, it's not very processed. It's very, um, you know, sun drenched and very simple. Uh, and, and it just has that romance to it, you know, and, and I think that uh, if I can eat a food and it, it 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 makes me see that place like Siena or something, you know. Then that's that's the beauty of the food, you know. It makes you think of uh, this beautiful place, uh, yeah. uh, and it evokes an emotion, and and that's what food does for us in wine. And so I like that. So if I'm in America, I'm obviously going to have I don't know a hamburger because that's their thing, you know. And uh, um, and I wouldn't have a hamburger anywhere else only in America, not because I like hamburgers so much, but because that is their thing to, to do a hamburger or a steak, a giant steak or something. So, you know, I think it's the same in every country. I like yeah. to experience their food right. that way. Yeah. 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 What is your favorite pizza? My favorite pizza? My favorite pizza, <laughs> if I have, I'm not in Italy and I have to eat pizza, it's kind of a Texas barbecue, so something that has a sauce to it, or uh, you has some kind of ground beef on it, or something, some green peppers and stuff. Uh, but if I'm in Italy, um, a straightforward pizza, maybe a, a tomato base, a little bit of garlic oil, uh, some basil, maybe some pepperoni and some, but definitely parmesan, and. Um, uh, that's it. Simple, simple with an yeah. with a nice yeah. Tuscan uh, uh, um, wine, uh, Cabernet or something like that. Something nice uh, to go with it, and yeah. and that's me set. I'm good for the evening. And, and then, and, there, then there is a party in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And then a homemade tiramisu, uh, homemade has to be homemade. My, like Mama would make, uh, like perfect. So yeah. and that's me. That's the perfect meal. Perfect meal. Yeah, true. Uh, I have a question about pizza, but there was a band there was on Instagram. Oh, yeah. what happened? Let me let me find uh, because the que they ask a question, but it's one of the questions that I ask everyone if I can okay. make work this phone. And the band was uh, Oncalo. Oncalo band ask, and this is also my question, does pineapple belong to pizza? <laughs> pineapple. Um, I have to say no. I have to say, I do have friends who like ham and pineapple on their pizza. And I have tried it. Um, and it's interesting. But personally, I have to say no, it yeah. doesn't belong to pizza. So you are... Uh... The f the fourth person that I interview for uh, this metal pizza project, yeah, and you are uh, the third one that say no, just one say yes. <laughs> oh and my god! Yeah, I'm I'm agree. For me, uh, no, I mean, it's... yeah, if, I mean... if it's not my pizza, whatever, then fine, but... yeah, fine. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, it's a personal thing. I mean, ham and pineapple goes very well together. Um, but ham and pineapple on a pizza, which they call a Hawaiian, I believe. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. But uh, yeah, it doesn't not work for me. No, not my thing. Yeah, I'm a traditionalist. I'll be more traditionalist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same. yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your time. It was It was amazing. Great. It was great to finally talk again with you because the, time flies by. I don't know. It's possible that it's only five years that I know. we met. Like, so <laughs> Yeah. It just isn't, you know, when you said that, I was like, oh, my God, was it five years ago? Wow. It just seems to go so quick, so quick, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, it was it was but, nice that you you were up to do this interview for me it was important since this is a new project and uh, i hope that your fans are, and all the people that are going to watch this interview enjoy it and uh, yeah do you well, want I'm to sure, do I'm, 
I'm sure they will, and they'll support you. And please, everybody who's, you know, if you're going to listen to this, you're going to watch it, you know, there's lots of things happening. So come to the site, come to Facebook and Instagram. But remember, this is Chris's new project, and please support this, because without Thank people you. like Chris and, uh, and these kind of entrepreneurs, you know, this is what keeps us alive, keeps us connected, and keeps us informed. So it's very important. So please support her. Uh, share this, share, share, share all of her work and let's just get it out there. Let's get it out there. And for me personally, it's so wonderful to see you. I'm so glad we did it. It's so much fun. And let's not wait another five years before. Yeah, future. let's do before. Yeah. And maybe you are going to play in Finland on a cruise. Uh, yes, yes. Septem September? September, yes, yeah. Yeah, I I have to check if I can manage to be there. Well, well, I, I will try, there, but I cannot promise nothing. Okay, well, let's do this. If you do get there, we'll try whatever pizza is available, and and okay. we'll we'll, yes. give, we'll do a test anyway. We'll do a test. We could make well, a video about that. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. We'll do a live video of us trying pizza, and if they've got ham and pineapple, we can do a live you know, vomit track where we both did it and then throw it back up or something. I don't know. But we could certainly like do a idea. live test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I let you know if I'm able to come. But Perfect. do you want to say something to your fans? I just want to say what I always say, you know, and I know this kind of sounds unremarkable now, but, uh, you know, without... Without the fans, there's no music, there's no industry. And so, you know, I, I understand economically it's very difficult and every band wants you to support your band, support your bands. But, you know, you can't do everything. It's not your responsibility, of course. But uh, support the artists who are supporting the bands is the key. And please, where you can, support live music, you know, particularly new bands, new artists, because they are our future. And uh, they are the next Metallicas and, and all of that. So, um, you know, where you can listen, listen, where you can be positive. And when you don't want to be positive, when you don't like it, don't say anything. Don't You don't need to uh, uh, discredit anybody. Just walk away. Don't listen, you know. But from, from our point of view and certainly from my point of view, Italy has been part of me since the early 80s. Uh, since my first incredible visit with my band, Atom Craft, and all through the Venom thing. And I can't thank you enough. Um, my new book is particularly in Italian for you. So, And that's because of my love of Italy. So thank you so much. Uh, molto uh, grazie, grazie mille. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you all very soon. Just be safe, be well, and see you soon.